morning, everyone. Welcome to a new session of the Economic History of Latin America Open Online course. Our lecturer today is Angel Alvarado. He's a fellow and the director of the Latin America project at the Penn Initiative for the Study of Markets. And today he will discuss the region's most recent history, the reforms, the return to populist movements, and the commodity boom cycle in the 90s. Angel, please. Thank you, Fernando, for the introduction and welcome everyone to this session. Uh, let me share my screen. So thank you so much. And well, this is a, the, the, are you seeing my, okay, perfect. So this is the, the last class before the final session. <clears throat> And today we cover the 90s and the, the beginning of this century, the 2000s. Uh, so it's the last 30 years of the history of Latin America. So we can define the 90s as the time of reforms, the period of reforms, and the 2000s, the rise of populism in the region again, and the coincidence with that, uh, the commodities boom with the rise of China uh, and the, in, in some sense, a new world order. So let's start with the reforms. As uh, Ivan mentioned last class, we have uh, an important crisis in the region in the 80s uh, related with the debt crisis. Uh, and this crisis was in some sense, a critical juncture that create new opportunities, the necessity of reforms, and the, especially the role of the state in Latin American economies is, is revisited. So there is a new wave for a more uh, free market economy, less statistic view of the state. And uh, after the big crisis of the 80s, there is a growing awareness about the diversified export sector, which was too small and insufficiently dynamic to finance the, the debt of the crisis that the debt uh, that, that was exploded in the, in the decade be, before. Uh, at the same time, you can see uh, as a consequence as well at the debt crisis and, um, and the decline in the capital flow to the state-owned enterprises, COEs, and that create a necessity to reform those enterprises that was uh, in red numbers. The bottom line was on red. And at the same time, an emerging consensus after the, the end of the Cold War about the market-oriented policies and a smaller, a smaller state is the time of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. Uh, is the time is the end of the communism and the necessity for a free market that the end was the market, the free market economy and democracy, the winners of the cold, the cold war. And, and in that, that context, we have to understand this uh, very inter interesting period of our of our history. So in brief, we can say that the new growth model is a model where trade is liberalized the financial markets were deregulated and the public enterprises were offered for sale to the private sector, sometimes international private sector. And, um, and which is very interesting is that this is a wave, an important wave, uh, a pattern that you can see in every country of Latin America, almost every country except Cuba, for example. But uh, if you, besides Cuba, you can see this, this, this movement, this wave in every country. This context, uh, I think that uh, the, the pattern was fostered by the end of the war. You can see as well that the war of drugs replaced communism as a US foreign policy priorities. And you see at the same time, the rise of the narcotics and the illegal markets in the continent, as well as the rise of the homicide rates uh, all along the region, especially in the roots of narcotraffics. And, uh, and I think uh, at the end, but not for that less important, is a period of 
globalization, or you can say a re-globalization of, of the economy. So uh, in this new period of globalization that some authors define a re-globalization, uh, it's a period where uh, Latin America get or got in bad shape. So uh, as you see, Asia was in very good shape to take advantage of the, this period of globalization. Latin America at this moment was in bad shape as a consequence of the, of the debt crisis. And, uh, and, the, and Latin America was in a period of adjustment when the globalization started. And I think that's gonna be very important to understand the performance of the economy during this period. So these reforms, the names of these reforms uh, are called um, the Washington Consensus. This is an informal lab label, was not formal. No, it's not uh, Washington called themselves Washington Consensus. It's not a consensus. It's not a consensus of IMF or the scholars. It's just a name, uh, but it's a name where, and which uh, is uh, known the, these, these reforms. So for that reason, I use the, the same, this, this, this level. So the Washington consensus is a list of um, reform support uh, by the Washington uh, in financial institutions, international institutions as, as an IMF, World Bank, uh, Inter-American Development Bank, and is also uh, uh, promoted and supported by political and economic elites in Latin America. And many, and many scholars that uh, studied in Latin America, in United States, economists that, is, that trained in the United States came to Latin America and, uh, and from, from their positions in the university, they were supported these, these reforms. And you can see in this, uh, in the Washington Consensus, two stages. The first one is the first half of the 1990s. It's a period marked by the financial and market liberalization. This is the easy part of the reforms and were accomplished by, oh, as you're gonna see for all the countries of the, of the continent of Latin America. An expression of this part of the reforms were Mercosur, which is a, a, a market of the southern uh, 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 countries of the continent, especially, you know, led by Brazil, Argentina, also Uruguay, Paraguay. You see the Caribbean community in 1992, uh, the NAFTA, this North American Free Trade Agreement with Canada, Mexico, and United States. You see the promotion after the summit in Miami, the uh, American, the um, Summit of Americas, the Free Trade uh, uh, Agreement of Americas during the time of Bill Clinton, uh, the Andean Pact, renamed Andean Community in 1995. So you see a pop-up of many uh, agreements of free trade. And this is uh, maybe the most important characteristic of this time, the trade liberalization. And maybe the consensus is that the best industrial policy is not to have an industrial policy. After many years of industrial uh, su the substitution by uh, import substitution industrialization model, you have a new model that believes in something in something that is very very different. And the second stage of the Washington Consensus is especially after the financial crisis, uh, the Asian financial crisis in 1997, is the necessity of the second generation of reforms referred to rule of law, quality of institution, microeconomic reforms, like a labor market reforms. And, uh, and this is, uh, well, sometimes uh, too little too late came this kind, so for some countries, uh, came these this kinds of uh, reforms that wa was trying to, to reform the weak states uh, of Latin America, uh, low capacities of the states, uh, you know, trying to handle with corruption, rent seeking behavior, and for example, uh, the high stakes politics, for example, and you can see, for instance, this, the, the reforms for decentralization in many, many countries. This is uh, what you have in Latin America, uh, many different trade uh, agreements, 
and the FTAA, Free Treatment uh, Agreement of America, was trying to have a just one uh, a trade agreement from Canada to Argentina and not to have this that was the result of the pop-ups on different uh, trade trade agreements. You have NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement in the North, Canada, US and Mexico. You have the Central American Common Market from Salvador to Costa Rica and Panama in the middle. Panama is not part of that because Panama is an uh, entry pot. You see um, Mercosur was founded by Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay. And you see three countries, uh, you have a, another, another, another Andean pact, which is uh, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia. Venezuela was part of the Andean pact uh, during that time. Then Venezuela uh, moved to uh, Mercosur. And you see, for example, the case of Chile that is outside the, the free trade agreement of, uh, is not part of a block, a commercial block was part of Chile promote um, bilateral trade agreements. You can see the, the, the dash line, which is a trade agreement with Chile and, and the different countries of Latin America. And Chile was part at the end of the Trans-Pacific Trade Agreement. So, which is uh, uh, Asian countries and uh, Pacific countries of, of Latin America. But what you see at the end is the promotion of trade is the, the effort of the region to take advantage of globalization. Uh, but as I said at the beginning, uh, Latin America was part of this process of globalization or, you know, um, try to catch the globalization when Latin America uh, was experiencing bad shape as a consequence of the debt uh, crisis of the, of the 80s. The another characteristic of the consensus, of the Washington consensus, is the macro prudent policy and, uh, and the importance of fiscal discipline, discipline after a, disaster, a, a chaotic a decade of the 80s with the hyperinflation, high level of inflation, uh, and macroeconomic instability. So now the consensus uh, is the, uh, the fiscal discipline basically reducing expenditures rather than increasing tax revenues is more or less the, 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 the consensus of, of the time. So the cut expenditures um, and cut um, uh, increasing tax revenues, but cut at the same time some kind of taxes. So for example, you can see here, you can see here, for instance, the, the corporate income tax and you can see in the in the yellow uh, bar, 1985, and uh, in the blue one at the end of the of the 90s. And you can see, for example, you, the, the, for instance, the case of Peru, where the corporate income tax uh, dropped from something like a 55% to 30%. In the case of Venezuela, from something close to 50% to 33%. It's a big uh, reduction in the corporate tax uh, um, rate, but is the pattern in all the countries, the exception is Uruguay, that keep the same level in 30% of income tax uh, uh, rate. So uh, there is an effort for fiscal discipline, but at the same time, uh, a, a policy of cut uh, uh, taxes as well, uh, the individual tax rate was reduced. Maybe Repub Dominican Republic is, an ex is, a, is a good case where the, the, the income tax came from something like a 73% to 25%. The case of Trinidad and Tobago from 70% to 33%. So there is a pattern of reduction of taxes and uh, and you can see the effort of the region to increase the revenues is through a value added tax rate that increase in almost every country of the region. You can see the yellow line, the yellow bar and the blue one, and you see the increase in the value added tax rate in Uruguay from something to of 20% to 33%. It's the same case of Costa Rica and you can see the Dominican Republic. So, the fiscal discipline 
is uh, basically redu reducing expenditures. Of course, there is an increase in tax revenues, but not through income or corporate tax taxes. Uh, is more or less through value added uh, taxes. Uh, at the same time, it's a cut on expenditures, especially subsidies, um, where an important category to, 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 to reduce uh, expenditures. And at the same time, the focus of the public expenditure should be education and health and public investment, not to invest anymore in the state on an enterprise that sometimes were in red uh, numbers. And uh, and um, well, is what what I, what, I, what I put here. No, COVID state enterprise losses were not anymore financed by uh, subsidies. So it, this is uh, the discipline that you see during 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 this period, and it's more or less the the consensus that you have not also in Latin America but also everywhere to cut taxes and reduce expenditures. At the same time, there is a liberation in the interest rates that should be market determined by during these periods. So the real interest should be positive, and this is the core of the monetary the monetary policy, and as well to is a part of the policy to attract investment for the for the new open economies that you see in in Latin America, and is uh, the policy that you have to discourage. The capital flight and increase savings, supposing that you live in a in a in an environment of not restriction and good institutions in in every in every country. Okay, um, and at the same time, the trade liberalization. One expression of trade liberalization during this period is the import liberalization, and uh, we we can see in other slides the the, the tariff rates that was reduced. Uh, in the in important way during, during this period. So what you see in the 80s is a restrictive attitude to the foreign direct investment. So you see that you have to be very careful to direct investment, to the investment that come from other countries, the mobility of capital. Now you see that this is good and you have to open the capital account to permit the um, the to to come many a lot of money that is moving all around the world, especially during this first stage of the new period of globalization. So, was uh, the capital market was eager to uh, increase the exposure in the emerging the emerging market, and uh, and at the same time you open uh, the 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 economy to the in, to the capital, to the foreign capital in some industries that were protected or were closed to the international uh, international market or international investment. So you open many industries for uh, privatization. I think it's, uh, it's, you can see here uh, by Lora, the cumulative value during the 90s of the privatization. This is uh, the level of privatization as a percentage of the GDP in 1999. So you see, for example, in the case of Bolivia, that uh, the value of privatization is around 20% of the economy. And you see low levels of privatization in countries like uh, Uruguay, Paraguay, Costa Rica, even Ecuador. And you see here that after Bolivia, you see uh, Peru, Brazil, Argentina, but the most important case is a case of Bolivia that implement uh, important reforms. Uh, the composition of privatization is related, especially to energy, especially in, uh, in these countries, Dominican Republic, uh, Colombia, Salvador, Argentina, Bolivia, and less important in Mexico, Uruguay, uh, and Venezuela. Uh, Mexico and Venezuela, the issue of nationalization of oil is a big issue in Mexico, uh, at the in the first half of the of the of the 20th century, in the case of Venezuela, after the nationalization in the 70s. So, uh, besides Venezuela, Mexico, Uruguay, and Uruguay didn't experience privatization. Basically, as you see, as we, as we show showed before. Uh, besides that, you see that the main uh, uh, sector, the principal sector of privatization, was energy, and then 
communication, telecommunication that was important in, in Mexico. In the case of uh, Carlos Slim, um, both an important telecommunication assets in Mexico during, during this period. Uh, okay. Finally, uh, in, as a in part of the what is known Washington Consensus is a promotion of competition by desregulation. Uh, there is a period where uh, control prices and exchange uh, controls were lifted and you see more competition and more free market and trying to get in the prices right. Uh, so trying to, to put all the prices uh, close or equal to the marginal cost of the of the of the of the marginal cost of the of the product of the product. So if you if you need if we need to to have a summarize of this uh, of this Washington consensus policy of the reform, we can say that we have a prudent macroeconomic policies or more prudent macroeconomic policies. Uh, outward orientation of the economy. So it's a model not looking inside, looking outward, looking to promote export, ex export especially non-traditional export, and free market economy. This is a this is an index created by Loda to follow the advance of the reforms in Latin America during this period. And you can see day by day, starting in 1989. 1994 and 1999 that well the first half of the of this decades was the the period where uh, reforms advance more and then advance less and uh, maybe this is uh, at the end of this period we have the asian financial crisis and that create many problems and many uh, turbulence in the economy of Latin America as well as the economy as the world economy. And I think it's important to see that the most important advance of the reforms were in the trade um, sector and then in the financial in the financial sector. And those advances were more important or prominent in the first half of the 90 of, of the 90s. Tax, were less important and privatization uh, less important and this is this is this is uh, good to, to to say this because some people believe that the washington consensus was the time of privatizations and that's true but was not the most important or more remarkable uh, reforms of, of this period and you can see labor and the labor market were a pending task for the region to reform the the labor market and and I think it's still pending in many 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 countries and this is the um, pensions um, the regulation of the sector and and uh, and, uh, and I think it's still the region uh, face an important problem with informal markets. So as a consequence of the of the reforms, especially with the macro prudent uh, macro the prudent macroeconomic policies, uh, maybe one of the achievement of the region is the control of inflation. After the hyperinflation of the 80s, uh, macroeconomic instability, you see now several central bank banks uh, succeed, you know, succeeding in reducing inflation. Uh, uh, for example, the case of Peru maybe is very important on this, and, and this is uh, Alberto Fujimori elected as a president of Peru during the 90s, and at the end of the 90s, Peru was a very successful policy reducing inflation. And, uh, and was one of the first central banks of Latin America to adopt a policy of inflation targeting. And, um, and Fujimori combines market reforms, which is known by Fuji chalk. This is a period of chocks. The, the, sometimes many policies were adopted by chalk, not by gradualism. But we have to say that the reduction of inflation in Peru was a gradual process during the whole decades of the 90s. But, but Fuji Chalk is the name, but what we know by, by this, this, this reform, especially with the liberation of uh, price controls, exchange rates control, and for that reason is, uh, is, is known by Fuji Chalk. And he combines market reforms with classical populism 
and we can add here color de melo in 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 in, in Brazil and uh, Carlos Menem in Argentina market reformers but at the same time uh, the same populism of the first wave of populism in Latin America that Jesus mentioned two classes ago and in fact in the case of Fujimori he closed the parliament in 1994 and was labeled as um as an autocracy as, uh, uh, and, and now some people refer the Marco reform with autocracy in, in Peru. So uh, the central bank, 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 bank the bank, central banks succeed reducing inflation, but certain dis distortions endure. One of them is the financial dollarization. After the, the period of hyperinflation and instability of the 80s, uh, the people distrust the currency, the peso, the sol, the new sol, the nuevo sol, uh, the bolivar, and um, and that create a high level of financial dollarization that you know make less effective the monetary policy and the capacity of the central bank to make an effective monetary policy. And one of that is the central bank experience the fear of floating which is to have a flexible exchange rate uh, to, you know, to promote confidence to the monetary policy, if we can say that that was monetary policy, was to fix, uh, peg the, the, the peso or the, the, the national currency to the dollar to try to fix the expectation of devaluation and inflation uh, among the public. For that reason, the central bank during that period accumulate high level of international reserve, you know, that means dollar, to protect the money, uh, the currency uh, against the speculative attacks uh, and banking, banking crisis. And I, and I think this is one of the most misunderstood, misunderstood um, uh, uh, issues of the of of this period and was very important in the crisis that we see after this period. So, this is the inflation in Latin America. You can see the eighties, a period of high inflation. The media uh, uh, peak at forty percent, and then you have a reduction during the the nineties. And in the case of Peru, you have a two percent inflation at the beginning of the new the new century. And that uh, succeed uh, policy was a consequence of, uh, of the, the independence of the central bank during that period. After you, you can see here an index, a CBI with central bank index, which is a, a index of how um, independence is uh, the independence of the central bank in, 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 the, in the region. So you can see here in Latin America, an increase in the dependence of the central bank in this period, the golden period. And that period is, uh, is at the same time the period when the central banks uh, control the inflation. So this is uh, one of the achievements, one of the conclusion of Latin America. If you want to control inflation, you have, you need an uh, and and, and autonomous cent central bank. These exchange rate regimes in Latin America during this period, you can see here in the 70s and 80s, many hard peg uh, change, reg uh, change uh, regime uh, change um, exchange uh, regime and then you can see that at the end of the 90s you have more intermediate and flexible uh, exchange rate regime in Latin America and that's a consequence of a central bank for more capacity to make a, a independent uh, an autonomous monetary monetary policy the other aspect of this period um, that, as I, as I mentioned before, uh, Latin America came late and didn't take a full advantage of the globalization is the free trade and the free trade policy during this period. This is a period where the import substitution industrialization is substituted by sub structural reforms, trying to attract foreign direct investment uh, instead of controlling or limiting 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 that investment, as we see in the period before, in the uh, during the during the after the well, after the Second World War till the um, debt crisis, this is a promotion of re re regional competition 
Before that, it's very uh, it's it's not common to see region re, regional integration. And now you see more regional integration and competition, different blocks, Mercosur and the Impact, uh, and many other uh, many uh, and the C Central American common market. This process of trade policy is led by politi politics and not by bureaucracy. And that is, a, a, this is a, an important point here. You know, the, the politicians during this period were eager to, to, you know, to promote the reforms, to promote the, the Washington consensus, to promote uh, all of those uh, policies. And for that reason, the involvement of the, the, poli the, the politicians in the, in the free trade agreements, free trade um, is more, more important. And this is a period of more democratic, you know, all the continent is de democratic except uh, except Cuba. So if you want to be part of a bloc, for example, Mercosur, you should be a democratic. So there is a clause of democratic countries and just democratic countries can join Mercosur, for instance. And of course, as a consequence of this, we have a re 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 reduce of protectionism. This is, a, this is a, a public opinion uh, about trade liberalization among Latin American countries during this period. And you can see that uh, almost 75% of Latin Americans believe that free trade is very good or someone good. So this is a golden period, not just for the central bank, it's a golden period as well for, for trade. This is, a, this is a, the, the tariff in, in, among Latin American countries. The tariff before the, the, the Uruguay run in 1994 is 35%, and after Uruguay run is just 11%. And what, what is nice here is to see that the, the, the agreement in the Uruguay run was to reduce the tariff from 35 to 32. And Latin American countries unilaterally reduced the tariff more than that to 11%. So uh, this is an important conclusion that sometimes some people believe that this was an imposition of Washington, for example, and that's completely false. You can see here the average of the war, and you can see that applied tariff rate was reduced in the war uh, mostly by unilateral, um, by, by the countries unilaterally. Some part multilateral, some part regional agreements, but the most important is unilateral. And this is most important in the case of Latin America. This is a tariff liberalization. You can see how the tariff goes, went down during, during this period, especially in the first part. But that reform start uh, in, the, uh, in the mid 80, uh, the decade of 80s. You can see uh, that is very homogeneous. There is no heterogeneity here. You can see that the case of Dominican Republic, the reduction of tariff from something like 85, close to close to 90%, the tariff in, in Dominican Republic to something around 15%. The case of Colombia as well was very, Colombia used to be very protectionist and it's an important reduction from something like a more than 80% to 11%. And well, the case of Brazil is important as well because it's very big from 80% to something around 15%. But all the countries reduced the, the tariff during this period. In the case of uh, manufacturing, the most important case is Brazil, a reduction from 60% to something around 15%. Uh, as well, the case of Venezuela and Ecuador, important reductions in manufacturing and primary sector. But after these uh, important uh, efforts of the region to integrate to globalization, so you can see that during this period, the country of Latin America was looking to Asia, China, Singapore, seeing that these countries were growing very fast. So Latin America trying to, to catch all those uh, countries. But after these reforms that were implemented in a you know, by chalk very fast, quickly, uh, the economic growth per capita economic growth uh, was uh, very low. Uh, during this period. Then in other slides, we're gonna see a comparison between Latin American countries and other countries. And you can see that maybe the most important achievement was the reduction of inflation to just one digit at the end of, the, of this period. 
but at the first half of the 90s, the inflation was higher than that we see uh, in the in the 80s. So at the at the at the at the end of the period, you can see the reduction of of inflation. Uh, but nothing changed in a big way in, in export, current account, the fiscal balance was more or less the, the same that you have in the in the past. So the reforms were not so effective in, in, in many ways. So maybe uh, the most important uh, uh, multinational industry that Latin America created during that period was narcotraffic and narcotics. This is a very famous person in the pop culture, which is uh, Pablo Escobar Gaviria, uh, the leader of the Medellin cartel that create uh, an important industry, not just in Colombia, all over Latin America, but especially in Colombia, to process cocaine, uh, to import the, the raw material from Peru and, and, and Bolivia, process that in laboratories in Colombia and export through different routes, through the Pacific, through the Atlantic, through, through Central America, through Panama, which is uh, important to, to remember that. So he created that roots and well, that created the only booming multinational industry ever created by Latin America and it's an illegal market. And that create many, many problems to the state, uh, the state of Colombia and many other states and reflects how weak are or were the states of Latin America to control the, the territory, to control the, the violence inside the boundaries of the, of the countries. Maybe you know this book, but it's maybe one of the best books of Gabriel Garcia Marquez, The News of a Kidnapping, is about the period when uh, Pablo Escobar declares the war against the state of Colombia and how he you know, um, made different terrorist attacks. It's a nice book that describes the, the sentiment of Colombia during that time, very difficult, very tough time to, to Colombia. And is uh, and you can see many of the of the 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 the, the persons that appear in this book were or are very important now in the politics of Colombia, which is the case of Francisco Santos, for example, Facho Santos, which is a, by, was vice president of, of Colombia. Here, there is a roots of narcotics, predicted roots by DEL, is a narcotraffic route, predicted by the econometric model, but it's an example of how different routes or how many options the Mexican cartel has to put the drugs, in this case, cocaine, inside the United States. And that is an intended consequence of uh, the free trade agreement of North American free trade agreement that opened the borders and opened the borders to goods of Mexico, but as well to narcotics from all over uh, the continent. And I think I have to mention this because 80% of the, of the homicides in Latin America are related to, to drugs, are related to these roots of narcotics. And that is why of the reason why Mexico is very, very, the, the level of violence that you see in Mexico that Medellin or Cali experience or experience now is the same of Venezuela, Honduras, and many other countries that are roots of narcotics. And the narcotics uh, was um, an, a threat, an important threat to the states of Latin America. And, uh, and I think it's important to mention this, how big this is market, because this market is between something between 14 billion to 48 billion, according to uh, Drugs and Formants Agency of the United States. So it's a big, big market, very booming market during this period of the 90s and 2000s. And, uh, and that makes that approximately 90% of the cocaine consumed in the United States transit through Mexico. At the beginning, these routes were controlled by Pablo Escobar, not just in Mexico, all over the Caribbean, but then the Mexican cartels controlled, controlled the routes. So I want to, to show you two examples of the, the crisis that Latin American experienced during, during this period. One is the tequila crisis, the Mexican crisis of 1994, and the second one is the Argentinian crisis of 2001 and 2000, 2002. 
So in 1988, uh, Carlos Salinas Gortari, the president of Mexico, uh, launched a program to reform and modernize the Mexican economy, you know, more or less uh, in the in the framework of Washington consensus, open the economy, re the regularization and privatization of many sectors, in the case of Mexico, except oil, gas, and, and energy in general, uh, a stabilization program, macroeconomic program to control the, the inflation, and the strategy to control the inflation was through or was, was based on maintain a strict link between the value of peso and US dollar. So it's to peg the, the peso to uh, two dollar. And it's the same, uh, you're gonna see the same in the case of Argentina and a broad social and economic agreement between government, private sector and labor unions, which is Pacto de Solidaridad to stop the increase on the spirals of wage and prices to stop the expectation and stop uh, inflation. Uh, so the IMF report of 1994 said that Mexico were experienced uh, an economic miracle. So Mexico, everything was going very well. The Washington consensus reform was working very well in Mexico. So there is a, 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 a something that uh, sent a signal, sent a, a message to the market that something is not working very well in Mexico. One was the assassination of Colosio in Tijuana in 1994 during um, a, ra a campaign rally. Uh, during the He was the, the, the presidential candidate of PRI, the most important the, the, the most important party of Mexico in the in the, the 20th century, and the appearance in the Chiapas region of Subcomandante Marcos. This is a guerrilla, a guerrilla in the South Mexico. So, well, this is a country that is doing very well, but was experiencing important problems. And that creates what, what is known now in the literature as a sudden stop. So basically, the, the, the Mexican stabilization program succeed reducing inflation because uh, they fix uh, the, the, the currency, in this case, Mex uh, peso to, to dollars. But that creates a problem. As Sebastián Eduardo said uh, in, in, uh, here, Mexico international competitiveness gradually declined. So, when you peg your money to, in this case, peso to dollar, you overvalue the, 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 your currency that creates a deteriorate the, 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 the current account. So you experience a, a lot of import and you reduce your export. And the only way to sustain the balance of, pay, of payment in this situation is to receive an inflow of capital from outside. So the capital inflows uh, uh, the country to finance increasingly large current account deficit. And, uh, and at some point, the capital inflow stops when the candidate is assassinated and you see a guerrilla in the South, the capital inflow stops. So when the capital stops, a sudden stop in this case, so what you see is uh, an important crisis. So um, at, at that moment, many people believe that the, the, the flow of capital didn't stop, no, this will continue in, in, all the time, but at some point that stops and that creates uh, a, a new problem. So uh, Dornbusch described this very well. He said that uh, the exchange rate based stabilization go through three phases. The first one is useful to underway stabilization, is what I'm referring to, peg your currency to, to dollar. But that creates another problem, that the second phase, the appreciation become apparent. And finally, in the third phase, it's too late to do something. Real appreciation has come to a point where a major devaluation is necessary. So at some point, you have the assassination of the president candidate, a new guerrilla movement in the South, and appreciation of your currency and something should be, should, you know, something should be, uh, you have to do something. And uh, Carlos Salinas de Gortari 
didn't do something at that moment. So they, they, they wait for the new Ernesto Cedillo government to do something. And what you see at the end is an important devaluation of the currency and all those uh, crises is what we know now, uh, the tequila crisis. That's, uh, that crisis create a sense that something is not well in the continent that uh, to fix your currency to dollar is so good to control inflation, but sometimes it's unsustainable. So you need more than that. And there is a, a less confidence among the central bank of the region to control inflation uh, following the Washington consensus. Of course, this is not the, the consensus of Washington. It was one of the policy promoted by IMF. In fact, IMF, uh, question the possibility of the central bank of the region to uh, have something mm, more or less related to freely floating exchange rate or inflation target objective. So they were very, uh, uh, you know, they, they don't believe in the capacity of the central bank to follow this. So they promote uh, to, to fix or to peg the currency to uh, to the dollar. So the IMF in some sense is some people believe is guilty of this kind of policy and that create a lot of anger, especially in the academia between scholars, politicians against the IMF for promote uh, uh, this kind of, of policy. It's the same problem that experienced Argentina and Brazil at the end of the nineties, the appreciation of the currency, deteriorating the current account uh, deteriorating the export sector. Uh, in this case, um, in, this, in the case of Argentina with the plan of convertibilidad, the 1991, and in the case of Brazil with plan real mm, promoted by Fernando Enrique Cardoso in the right, Carlos Menem in the left. Another critics to the Washington consensus uh, is that was interpreted like, a, like an imposition of Washington. What's not an imposition of Washington? It's more a bureaucratic movement among the uh, economies in the IMF or World Bank, but for some people, especially for the narrative in the 2000s, especially from the left, is like uh, these reforms were promoted by Washington. And some people believe that Washington consensus is an extreme and dogmatic commitment we, and the belief of, of market that market can solve everything. So Deus ex machina, the market can solve everything. And we know that the market needs more, uh, an institution, a framework to work. And one of the problems during that time is that the institutions uh, and the theory and institution that is at the core of the economic theory today was not so important or was in the early stage at the beginning of the Washington consensus in the 90s, uh, in, at the beginning of the 90s. But maybe uh, the political the political critic to the Washington consensus is uh, that Washington consensus was interpreted that like uh, the country was put in the driver's seat. So, like uh, the the leadership of the of the Washington of the reforms were Washington, and I have to say again that the local elites, the political and economic elites, were another enthusiastic promoters of the, the of this kind of of reforms. Stiglitz make a critic in an important interview at the end of the nineties, saying something more or less that uh, that. The, 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 these reforms were made without an adequate democratic debate. So you have democracy, but the people, uh, the ordinary people don't know what's going on with the economy. So we're more or less an, an elite discussion about the reforms, but were not uh, a discussion among all the sectors of the, the population. And that was uh, one of consequence of this is what, which is known as uh, Caracaso, the 27th of February of 1989. This is a picture of Barrio El Esfuerzo, effort neighborhood in Petare, North Petare. This is my district. 
or used to be my district in, when it was in Congress. And this is a, a, a biggest slum of Venezuela, uh, very poor. Uh, it's the place, this is the, the day of Caracas. So these guys came from the top of the hill to the valley of Caracas, which is here, uh, to looting uh, and protest. And because the police those days were in a strike, uh, the government used the, the army, the military force to repress. And hundreds of people were killed in, in, in Petare and many other places of Caracas. And in fact, today in the mind of these guys, the impression of Caracas is very important, especially the repression and the, you know, the the connection between reforms, which is when Venezuela is known as paquetazo, with repression, and that was you know part of the narrative of what we know later as as chavismo. Okay, so uh, this is these people were expecting something with Carlos Andres Perez. Carlos Andres Perez was in I think in the second month of his mandate. He was a new president of Venezuela. Was uh, this? He was in the World Economic Forum in Switzerland, in Davos, the day of Caracas. So that they arrived to to Caracas, and what he received is this explosion of angry among the populations. So we can. I, I have to say something about why did the Washington Consensus fail. There are so many alternative explanations, you know. Uh, and in fact, the explanation changed during the time. At the end of the 90s, uh, you can find something like an insufficient commitment to the original reform agenda. So what failed is that the Washington consensus of the reform needs more liberalization need, was, was needed. Well, that, this is one of, of the approach. Uh, another one is that uh, was not possible to accomplish, to, compl to complement uh, the second generation reform based on basically institutions and active social policies. This is another, another variant of why Washington Consensus failed. And, uh, and in, in, this, in this second generation, you can find the reform of the reforms uh, basically, it's like a, you need more reforms, but not all the reforms were quite good. So you need another reforms and continue, continue this. But maybe uh, the most important now is that the reforms lack of consideration of institutions. So, and especially in Latin America. So you need, uh, during the reforms, the focus were on macroeconomic policy, which is very important, but besides macro, you all you also need uh, institutions and institutions and state in Latin America were very weak. So, mm, mm, uh, especially after the literature of the '90s with Douglas North and then Asimov and Robinson, what they insist is the the role of institutions. So you need institutions to uh, accomplish the reforms, and there is a complement. Is not the, they are not substitutes, are complement, and that fail. Maybe it's the most important critic or, or why or variant explanation of why reforms fail during during the nineties. This is an explanation of Moses Moses Naim. Moses Naim was the the minister of commerce of Venezuela during that period. So he said that the the, the model was incomplete. So he is more or less in, the, in this part that the more liberalization was needed. Uh, this is what he wrote after in 1994. So maybe his opinion changed during the time. And uh, the results were quite different from what politician promised. And this is especially in the case of Venezuela, the people were expecting a government like at the first Carlos Andres Perez, very populist, very populist government, a lot of uh, expenditure, a high level of, uh, of um, a public expenditure. And what you have is an austerity policies that uh, explode, that create this explosion of angry among the population. I have to say that the trigger of the Caracas was the increase of the, the gasoline by 30%. Okay, uh, another, another 
uh, uh, explanations of why Washington Consensus fell is that the Washington Consensus uh, policies uh, was more oriented to efficiency than, than equity. So um, the social issues didn't figure prominently in the market reform agenda, and that create the sensation that there is just a policy for the rich, uh, pro-rich policy, and no pro-poor policy or pro-poor reform that were needed in Latin America as, as well. Well, <clears throat> But I have to say that uh, after the, the, the decades of the 90s, the, the reforms continue and the market economy continues in Latin America, especially in, in the case of Chile, in the case of Colombia, in the case of Peru, in the case of Mexico and Brazil. So uh, the, the market agenda continues and, uh, and, uh, and, and the model of the new paradigm was the reforms of, of, of the 90s. Another aspect that created a lot of angry among the politicians were that many loans were conditional to adopting some of policy reforms of the Washington Consensus. And that created many angry positions uh, among the politicians in, in Latin America. But well, I think that at the end, uh, maybe the most important critique to Washington consensus is the Argentina, the Argentina, Argentina crisis. Uh, I have to mention, I want to make two slides about it. I think it's important to understand a little bit this uh, because it's a turning point to what we have in the next decade. So uh, uh, Carlos Menem as a president uh, passed a convertibility law. Uh, this is a uh, well. This now is uh, is 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 like a funny, but at that time was like a the panacea to resolve all the problem of Latin America, especially Argentina. The convertibility law is to peg the peso, the new peso, to uh, to U.S. dollar parity, one to one, one peso, one dollar. And you pass a law to 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 guarantee this. And at the same time, Argentina didn't maintain a prudent fiscal policy. It's very difficult because you don't have the institutions to, to do this and you don't have the, the, the discipline. So this is a bomb, a tic-tac bomb that was put in, in Argentina during the 90s. And uh, you, have, uh, you don't have the flexibility to, to absorb the shocks. So you have a... a, a, um, a, a, a no flexibility in the change rate, no change rate of flexibility. You don't have flexibility in the labor markets. So you don't have the capacity to absorb shocks. And I think uh, Joseph Tiglitz make a good description of the, of the Argentina crisis. He wrote, suddenly Argentina fortune change. The precipitating event was the ace Asian crisis of 1997, which by 1998 had become the global financial crisis. Global interest rates to emerging markets soar. The strong dollar compound these problems. Since the Argentina peso was tied to the dollar, it was increasingly overvalued. More or less, it's the same case of the tequila crisis of, of Mexico. And, uh, and as Stiglitz mentioned, fortune of Argentina. Yes, because uh, when, when, when you have a uh, um, uh, this uh, when you peg your 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 doll your your the peso in this case to dollar, you see uh, an important increase in the consumption among the Argentinians because the money the money is overvalued, so the capacity of consumption of the population is very high. So during that period, the nineties, Argentina felt like uh, we are very rich, we are rich again. So this is the solution. The dollarization of the economy is the solution that, that, uh, to our problems. And expression of this is the, uh, in my opinion, is the Ultimo Concierto, is the final tour of uh, So Stereo, the most famous band in Latin America in 1997, uh, which is an expression of soft power of Argentina, the rock and the, and the prosperity of Argentina. And the second one, if the intercontinental uh, cop of Argentina went 
Boca Juniors beat Real Madrid in 2000. So Argentina was, you know, in the in the brink of uh, of the of the modernization, the prosperity, doing very well, soccer, uh, rock, and everything was doing very well. Argentina received a lot of uh, of a lot of capital. For example, in 1990, 1981 the stock prices of Argentina increased by 400% just in one year, 400%. The increase of the stock uh, prices in Argentina in 1991. So Argentina received a lot of, a lot of money. But uh, the problem here is that uh, they fix the change rate. And when you fix the change rate, you have to decide if you have a free capital mobility or you have independent monetary policy. In the case of, for example, uh, this is a trilemma. Maybe uh, Reinhard and Calvo, 1994, is a good paper to understand this trilemma that many uh, emerging markets experienced during during the 90s. So you can you can you can you cannot achieve all the objectives at the same time. You cannot have an independent monetary policy at the same time peg your currency to dollar and at the same time have a free capital mobility. You have to decide what to do. So for example, in the case of Argentina, Argentina decided to have a free, ca free, free capital uh, mobility and uh, fix a change rate. These are disastrous consequences. The same case of Mexico before the tequila crisis. Uh, you have the case of Brazil, Colombia, or Chile who decide to fix a change rate and uh, don't have uh, free market, free capital mobility. So in that case, they have the capacity to have independent monetary policy to, uh, to absorb the shocks of the international international market. So, <clears throat> so I think important to mention this because at, this, uh, uh, at the end, what Argentina experienced was that, and in two, in, at the end of 2001, after weeks of riots and political unrest, uh, Fernando de la Rua, the president of Argentina, uh, resigned as a, as a president, escaped from the Casa Rosada, the presidential palace in the uh, downtown Argentina, by a helicopter, and the mother of all crisis explode. Uh, weeks later, Argentina defaulted the foreign debt. Uh, the peso was devaluated more than 66%. Uh, you know, four weeks, Argentina has five presidents, you know, a, a chaotic time for Argentina and uh, maybe the most traumatic currency and banking crisis, but at the end, you know, the banking crisis, uh, a banking crisis explodes in Argentina. And, uh, and well, maybe it's uh, the best expression of uh, the, uh, of a trade imbalances, uh, and uh, an instability in, in Argentina. But I think Sebastian Edwards make a point here on the importance of Argentinian crisis. The implosion of Argentine economy in 2001 and two has become one of the most important arguments against globalization, market reforms, and so-called neoliberalism, uh, maintaining the peg even in the absence of supporting fiscal and other key policies. And this is important because uh, three years before uh, the IMF uh, was saying that that was the kind of policy that Argentina should follow in this document of 1998. So um, as a consequence of this, what you see in the continent is a rejection to reforms. Uh, as I said, as I mentioned before, the, the reforms continue in many, many countries, but there is a re re rejection and the creation of new parties, especially from the left, like uh, Movimiento Quinta República in Venezuela, and uh, with the Chavismo to go against the market reforms of, of the 90s. Maybe one of the best expression of this is um, well, is the well? I'm going to mention that before, but there is a, a lot of movement around this. So this is the end of the '90s, and I think I have more, like, a 15 more minutes to to make some comments about the the 21st century and the commodities boom and the the surge again of the populism in in Latin America. So this is the populist events. 
You can see, I think uh, Jesus mentioned the first wave of populism. This is uh, from Perón to uh, Carlos Andres Perez in Venezuela. This is the first wave of populism. And you have a second wave with uh, Color de Melo, Menem and Fujimori, as I mentioned before, the second wave is a, is a, is a combination of populism and free market reforms. You know, a combination of that, I mentioned that before. And then you have a new populist movement or wave with Evo Morales, Rafael Correa, um, Alan Garcia, the second Alan Garcia, uh, Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro, and uh, Cristina Fernandez de, de Kirchner. So this is the second wave of populism in Latin America. So there is a, 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 a divergence in Latin America. You see some countries that continues to do very well, keeping, maintaining the reforms, the case of Chile, the case of Colombia, the case of uh, Peru, even Mexico. And you, have, or you see, uh, and you see other countries that was against the reforms and uh, and follow the temptation of populism. Maybe the the most you know paradigmatic case is Venezuela. Uh, in the as a special guest, we will have um, Francisco Rodriguez to talk about this. I don't want to mention too much about this, but I just want to say that is the paradigmatic. The, um, a case in the case of, of Venezuela. But this new wave of populism is quite different that you see in the past because this populism was, a, was in the time of commodity prices boom. So this is a correlation. Uh, and the, I, sorry, but the, it's quite, uh, the, the, the resolution is not so good, but I'm gonna explain this. The, this is in blue, the numbers of populist regimes in Latin America. So this is 2000 and you see the increase in the price of metals, increase the number of populism in Latin America and the decrease of price of metal decrease the number of populism, the populist government in Latin America. It's the same case with the, 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 the price of food, the increase of price of food in 2000 increased the populist regimes and the decrease, decrease the, the number of populist regime, the regimes, and the case, the same case of fuel energy. So there is a, a, a correlation between commodity boom and populism, and that opened the door to populism again, when you have a lot of money to, to waste or to increase the public expenditure. And that was a very bad coincidence for, for Latin America, and the emergence of the, the, the Argentina crisis and the commodity boom then, to not to take advantage in the, the right way of the, the globalization. Another characteristic of this uh, new wave of populism is the duration of this, this kind of government. Because uh, the populism is a sustainable policy, the average of populism of the first and the second wave of populism is just five years. But the third wave of populism is quite long and is the double of the time of the first wave of the third and second wave of populism is more than 11 years. And more, the, most, the longest one is the case of, of Venezuela. So it's another characteristic of the international context of how globalization uh, affect the populism in, in, Latin, in Latin America. So as I, as I mentioned, the, the first wave of populism was on the, on the umbrella of Washington consensus. The second wave of the, the, the third wave of populism was uh, in the time against the neoliberal policies and the clash between el pueblo and the elites uh, and the elites that promote the Washington consensus in the nineties. So now the, that pueblo, or the people are against the, the reforms. The example of this, the most important as I mentioned is Chavez Correa, Ortega and Maduro, Chavez in Venezuela. So what we see here in these countries, not in all the countries of Latin America, is an increase in the size and role of the, the state and economy. So for example, in the case of Venezuela, if Carlos Andres Pérez privatized the, the airline the public air, uh, uh, airline of Venezuela named Biasa, the name was Biasa. So now the Chavismo want to create a new Biasa. 
is the Carlos Andres Perez privatized the, the telecommunication sector, Chavismo want to nationalize, nationalize the sector and so on. So in some sense, the, the Chavismo is, um, is uh, back to the future, <laughs> go back to the, 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 the policies of the 70s, the debt lab uh, model. And some people believe is nothing is new here, uh, except in the case of the radicalism against uh, United, United States. So uh, the, populi the populist rhetoric um, is more related in this case to nationalist uh, ideology. Uh, um, and especially in the case, of course, of Venezuela with the bolivarianism, bolivarianism you know, to promote the, the, the figure, the, the, the name of Simon Bolivar. Simon Bolivar is in the heart of the history of Venezuela and it's very important. And, but the Chavismo, you know, make a, a point here and said that Bolivar was uh, anti, anti, anti Washington consensus and that, uh, that kind of stuff that, uh, that is very, uh, you know, is a very demagogic uh, use of, of, of Simon Bolivar. So, not all uh, in the, the difference with the third wave of populism is that not all the populist regime in Latin in the third wave um, follow an uh, unsustainable economic policies. For example, Bolivia, which is a populist uh, regime, very nationalistic one, was uh, follow more or less a very macro prudent uh, economic uh, macroeconomic policy. Uh, is the same case of Brazil with a very nationalistic rhetoric, anti, anti free market economy, but follow uh, an important uh, social programs like Bolsa Escola, but at the same time with uh, macroeconomic prudence. So I think it's this, this new wave uh, of nationalistic movement were not all nationalistic, and if, if it, they're nationalistic, uh, populist not where uh, um, macroeconomic, um, macroeconomic populist. I have to mention that maybe one of the reasons why Brazil, in the case of Lula, the Brazilian Worker, Workers' Party and Uruguayan Broad Front, Frente Amplio Uruguayo, don't follow populist uh, policies is that these are or were an old parties and where the left-wing parties, the only two established uh, left-wing party to remain after the era of market reforms. And that's very important. There were not new movement and that create the sense of responsibility to follow uh, macroeconomic prudent uh, policies. And maybe here you have a Lula, which now is the president of Brazil. I think, I think it's a third term. Um, but I, I, don't have, I don't want to mention to the police of, of Brazil now, but what I'm going to say is that Brazil keep the market reforms and increase the expenditure in the, for, for like us, the, the social issues like a Bolsa Escola and, and other conditional cash transfers and were very successful policy. So they keep an, a, an equilibrium between the market reforms of the 90s and then complement that reform with other so, social policies that uh, a country that Brazil needs because the high level of inequality. So, um, so well, uh, but more or less what we have, uh, in the case of Brazil and everywhere in Latin America is an, a disillusion with the market oriented reforms and the sense that the region needs another paradigm, which is, uh, which at some point were Chavismo. Chavismo had a lot of money for, for during a lot of time and Chavez and Lula was trying to lead the region in that period. Uh, but we know very well now that Chavismo were not the the solution to an alternative model to Latin America. And we're not an alternative model because the, the rentier populism as some author uh, uh, refers to, to Chavismo, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, commit or follow three temptations. Expropriation temptation was 
you know, maybe the most important intention that Hugo Chavez followed to destroy the Venezuelan economy, as in the special lecture of the Thursday we're going to see. The second one is the populist intention, which is uh, the, the, the macroeconomic populism in the sense of Sebastian Edwards mentioned in other, other classes. In the, uh, so the temptation to follow or to run big fiscal deficits. And the third one is the solutive temptation to destroy uh, the, the democracy. So an author like a Sebast Sebastian Mazzucca, I have to mention that Sebastian Mazzucca has basically said that when you expropriate and follow the populist temptation, at the end, you're going to have absolutist temptation. And this is the case of Venezuela, expropriation and populist temptation. The case of Bolivia, you have a Mm, 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 expropriation, but not populist temptation. So you don't have absolute temptation as the same case of Bolivia and Argentina. So the case of Venezuela is special because Venezuela follow expropriate temptation and populist temptation. At the end, what you have is absolute temptation and is the destruction of democracy in, in Venezuela. So Hugo Chavez follow an expropriation to, from the very beginning, especially in the oil sector. Uh, affecting in 2001, three, 33 multinational companies, especially in Orinoco Basin, in the south part of, of the country, uh, and increasing the, the taxes uh, from one to 30%. Uh, so what, well, create a big mess, uh, an impossible, was almost impossible to, to, to make a business in the oil sector of Venezuela, uh, expropriating, sending uh, the, the, the wrong signal to, to the markets, uh, increased the presence of the PDVSA in many, in many, many projects. So that create, that this is what we know as a, as a expropriation temptation. There are many, Chavez expropriate more than close to 2000 assets in Venezuela, but obviously the most important one was this, the oil sector. And this is what we know the expropriate intention. And then you have the other one is uh, the populist temptation, Chavez increase the, uh, the public expenditure, especially the social expenditure in unsustainable levels. Um, and that is the populist temptation. So when we have both, what you have is a destruction of democracy, is the, the increase of the, 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 the public expenditure in Latin America during this period, especially the social public expenditure, and increase very in an important way during the, 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 the 90s and then during the two, 2000s. The problem is not to increase the social expenditure. The problem is when you follow an unsustainable policy doing, doing this, especially when you have a lot of volatility because you depend on commodities, which is the case of many South American countries. And here you can see the volatility of the, the revenues of the state of Latin American countries in comparison with European countries. And you see that volatility in Latin America is very high. So if you want to follow an increase in the social expenditure, you should be sure you can keep it during the time. Because if you don't, if you don't have that capacity, the economy gonna go in the uh, populist temptation. Well, this is Hugo Chavez. I know this guy very well. And he was the guy who followed the expropriation temptation, the populist temptation at the end, what you have with Maduro is a destruction of democracy. Well, I mentioned this before, the, the different case of Venezuela, when you compare Venezuela with Bolivia and Argentina, um, all of them were radical government, but don't follow of, or the expropriation or the populist temptation. So you have a continuation in the fiscal, the fiscal policy. Well, I, I just want to finish. I know we are, we are close to finish, but I will have to mention this. This is the moment when uh, George Bush received the news about the terrorist attack in Manhattan in, in September 11. So that moved the focus of United States outside, you know, the focus were Afghanistan and Iraq. And at the same time in 2001, um, Apparently, United States were involved in a coup d'etat against Hugo Chavez. So, but those events reduced the leadership in the United States, uh, the invasion of Iraq and the, and the involvement in the coup in Venezuela 
reduce the leadership of uh, of United States in the region and open at the same time uh, China joined the World Trade Organization. So China more or less became a new actor and an important player, especially in South America. And uh, and here, here you can see how the manufacturing in Argentina, you know, the trade, uh, how, how the after 2001, the manufacturing in export of China increased very fast and how Latin America can not keep the pace of, of China and China became a player, substitute Latin American industry in some sense, some on Latin American industry, and became a big player who promote, who increase the, who, who create the commodities boom in 2001 and make a, a China a new player in, in Latin America. You see here the reduction of the presence of uh, the United States as a foreign direct investor from something like a 35% to 30, less than 30%. And the increase of China here, you see China increasing the presence and increasing as a, as a, as a lender even of, of the region. And uh, this is a trade between Latin America and Asia. You can see here how after 2001, with the war of terrorism and the, when China joined the World Trade Organization, how China increased uh, a lot the presence and the trade uh, among Latin American countries. And this is Asia, but if you have you have to see here that basically when we refer to Asia, the increase we, is the, the case of, of China after 2000, 2001. Finally, Latin America can follow that level of uh, growth with China, basically because the competitiveness of the region is is very is, is lower than uh, than than Asia. This is a comparison. Uh, the exception is Chile, and this is why Chile do it better because the competitiveness is better and institutions were better during this period. The education of Latin America is not so well as well as the case of South Asian countries. So that create a lack uh, uh, in Latin American countries in this period of, of globalization. So finally, uh, uh, um, the minimum wage during this period increased, especially after 2001 in the commodities boom period, where a better period than the decade before. Uh, you can see the reduction, important reduction of poverty, especially after 2001, from something related close to 50% to 30%, and decrease in the Gini coefficient. So, well, and finally, Fernando, and thank you so much uh, for this extra time, the performance of Latin America uh, that is the lower than emerging Asian countries. Latin America were the region that growth less uh, than other other regions in the in the world. Finally, the case of uh, uh, Latin America, the growth was important, but not so spectacular, in, except the case of Chile, that growth faster than other countries. And I think I have to say that is that Chile just not follow the macroprudent policies, but because Chile as well promote more reforms in institution in Latin America. So thank you so much and. Uh, I'm open to hear some questions. All right. Yes, uh, I have a question from the audience. So one, it refers basically to when you were talking about the demise of the Washington consensus and the reactions against it. So uh, the, the question is, could you provide an example of what do you mean by that, by the, the reform, the reforms example? And if you can provide a policy example of that, yeah. For example, the 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 sudden stop events in Mexico is a reform of the reforms. When you <clears throat> promote central banks uh, not to peg the currency to dollar or to have more flexibility in the change rate policy, this is a reform of of reform. For example, this is a, this is a case is what didn't happen in Argentina. And this is what I mentioned, the reform of reform. You see that after the first stage of reform, you see that some countries follow other policies, try to, you know, to have a better uh, macroeconomic policy. 
So there is a there is a consensus that you have you need a, a prudent macroeconomic policy, but you know you don't have a a, a single bullet or, or a silver bullet, fixed rates or flexible rates. But at some point, what the reform reform I'm referring to is the necessity to fix or not to fix to sharp to have a better uh, policy uh, after the you learn what failed in this case, the case of tequila crisis in Mexico. Okay, a second set of questions more or less refer to redistributive aspects of the events that occurred more or less in the 90s, especially to those devoted on the macroeconomic aspects and the mon monetary convertibility. So for example, one question asked more or less, who are the ones that benefit the most out of the convertibility issues or the fear to float aspects of, of in the economy? The people, you, digamos, the, the benefits of that is, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. well, in the long term, I think there is, uh, I don't see, you know, many people who benefit from that. You can see the, the Argentinian crisis was a big, big, big crisis, but, you know, I think nobody inside Argentina, but maybe uh, Brazilians, uh, who export many, many goods to Argentina or, um, you know, the, the, the countries where Argentina imports were the winners of that kind of, of policy. But inside Argentina, I see that was a big shock to Argentina crisis uh, is the mother of all crises. So I think I don't see too much benefits to, to follow this policy, except in the case that you control inflation for a long period. You have a uh, big winners in the stock market of Argentina in 1991. So some people wins, but as a society, I think uh, there is not too much uh, winners in this kind of, of, of policies. Okay, thank you everybody. With this, we conclude the ninth week and we will return then Thursday. We will talk about basically the case of Venezuela with uh, Dr. Francisco Rodriguez. And see you then.